If you have a Bible, I invite you to take it out and turn to Genesis chapter 23. And we are going to cover two chapters this morning, a lot of ground. We won't read every word, but in God's timing, I think this text is going to encourage us this morning. I'm excited for the journey and the story that continues in God's Word. The title of the message this morning is From Generation to Generation. From Generation to Generation. And what we are going to see in these two chapters, it's really interesting. It's a morning of reflection on some big events because we see the death of Sarah and her burial. And we see the wedding and the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah. What do pastors do? We bury and marry. And in these chapters, we're seeing a burial and a wedding. But what we see is the camera pan and the story move forward. And it begins to transition from Abraham and Sarah, the patriarch and matriarch, this family that God's called and sent out on this mission. And it moves now to the next generation, to Isaac and to Rebekah. There's a lot of tension at this point in the story. In fact, the Israelites, who would have heard this story recounted and told, as the tribal chiefs would have gathered the people at a time when Israel would have been wandering and in exile and not in their home promised land. They would have been hearing this story wondering, is there a future for us? And they would have been hearing their story recounted and they would have come to this story. There there would have been real tension in their lives and they would have been really on the edge of their seat at multiple points along the way in this story. Still asking and that question that keeps getting answered, doesn't it, through the story, is God faithful? Can we trust Him? As you, we saw last week in Pastor Josh, the, one of the most amazing chapters in the Bible in Genesis 22, right? Abraham offers up Isaac and God provides. Provides a ram. Substitute for the sacrifice and gives Abraham, his son Isaac, back as though from the dead. And we're going to see that God is faithful from generation to generation. We're going to see, just as Paul told us, told us in Romans chapter 15, that whatever was written in former days, talking about the Old Testament, talking about Genesis, was written for our instruction, and that through the endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures that we might have hope. I had a question for us. Where does hope come from in the midst of persecution? displacement and wandering. Where do we place our hope? Will there ever be a place where people can truly live in peace, free from enemies, free from thieves breaking in, moth or rust or fire or ISIS destroying? When will we be home? When will we be safe? When will we have peace? When will evil be overthrown? See, the Israelites were asking these very questions as they listened to the story unfold. Where is the safe and secure homeland, the promised land that God said would be ours? When will we take possession of it? When will we come into that land? When will we have a final resting place? When will God make good on His promise? Years later, the disciples were asking some of the very same questions of Jesus. Where are you going? Why can't we go with you? Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? When will we be home? Where do we put our hope? These are questions we still ask today. As you look at the world, we look at the world, you see the news. You saw it this week. Iraq. Israel. Cities and countries throughout the world, and even closer to home, we are not as free from danger as we desire. Danger abounds. Even for some who've moved away from population centers to live quietly in the country, only to have their homes taken by wildfires, 
Where can we go? The city? The country? Is there anywhere safe and secure? Some people, I, I know personally, I mean, people, they avoid the news. It's too depressing. Others reach a point where cynicism kind of settles in and takes hold and finds a home in the heart. Others put their hope in a video going viral to raise awareness and funds, or protests, or diplomacy, or legislation, or nonprofits, or education, or airstrikes. None of these are bad things. Is that where you put your hope? I got an email on August 8th, is that Friday, from our friends and missionaries in Iraq, northern Iraq. Been waiting, wondering not when's the time to go, do we stay, do we go? Young family, less than one year old little baby, there for the glory of God, there to make disciples, there to plant churches among the Kurdish peoples who've not heard about Jesus. He sent this email. I'm going to read it for us. It shows us the relevance and perspective, not only what's going on in the world today, but some of these very same questions the Israelites were asking as we approach our text this morning. He says, hey everyone, he's been keeping us regularly updated as the ISIS is doing their thing and violence is drawing near. He writes this, yesterday we woke up in our beds like any other day. We heard there was a need for basic supplies for refugees from Sinjar, Iraq. We went to buy wholesale goods in bulk to bring to the distribution center, which was pretty much empty when we brought our load. An hour or so later, my closest local trusted friend and ally in our cause called me and said, now is the time to go and that we mustn't delay. We had been on high alert before this. We proceeded to pack our lives into two suitcases, stuff religious materials into the ceiling tiles of our house, bring our car to a friend's garage, stopping only to say two very heartbreaking farewells to our friends. We cannot tell you how incredibly difficult it is to have to flee from your home and the life that you know. After six hours of trying to get through the border, which was crowded with thousands of refugees, we walked across the bridge into Turkey with tears in our eyes as we left our home and our friends, never knowing if we will see them again. God's provision for us through this long, wearisome process was amazing. It is far too much to write. After cramming in a van with 20 other people searching town for hotels, we finally found what we think may have been the last hotel room in a town, small town in southeast Turkey. It was, let's say, humble, but we were so grateful. We're writing to you from an airport in central Turkey. We had planned on taking a vacation in Europe before a training we were attending at our organization's headquarters in England. Though we did have to evacuate and we did view it as imminent, we still do have plans to return and view this as simply an extended time away while we wait for the situation to calm down. Pray with us that we might be able to return to our home. One of the frustrations of Kurds and Iraqis is the lack of reporting that has happened on the situation. Thousands have lost their lives at the hand of cold-blooded murderers. Hundreds have been sold into slavery. Human rights have been trampled. We saw and wept with our own eyes the many thousands sleeping on the side of the road with nothing other than the clothes on their back. ISIS is wicked beyond what I can write, and they are heading towards our home and the people we love and left behind, many of whom have no option to leave as we have been able to. As I now just check in, check the news after 30 hours off the grid, my tendency, listen to the theology in this man's bones, my tendency is to put my hope in American airstrikes or Kurdish Peshmerga victories, all fleeting hopes. Our hope is in the great King Jesus, who is called faithful and true, who is coming in righteousness to right every wrong being committed in Iraq right now and bring judgment to those who have done wrong. Our hope is in the gospel, which is so much stronger than ISIS, so much stronger than Satan, and so much stronger than sin. Through His cross, Christ has purchased people who are without hope in darkness and brought them into His light. No matter what the situation, in genocide, in war, in persecution, the gospel cannot fail. It will continue to advance and is advancing, especially as we see many who are becoming disenchanted with the ways of sin and war and longing for the true King. And most of all, our hope is in God. What ISIS means for evil, God has meant for good. He will complete His work. He is better than anything. 
better than a home, better than a community, better than life itself. Each step along the incredibly crazy, heartbreaking, exhausting journey into Turkey, we had to keep reminding ourselves, and he put this in quotes, He is faithful. He is good. He is reigning over this. As we mentioned before, we saw God work in amazing ways in the past 24 hours. We know this is from God working through your prayers for us, and we are so grateful. Shepherd, their young child, made the journey like a champ and was a cheerful face for us in our sadness. Thank you for your prayers, emails, and encouraging words. Pray with us for our extended time away. Pray that we would be able to return next month. Pray for wisdom as we debrief this with leaders at our international office, church, and others in our lives. Pray for our friends back in our city whom we love dearly. Pray ISIS would come nowhere near them and would be pushed back, obliterated, and defeated. Pray for the gospel of the glory of Christ to be seen and treasured by many in our city, region, and country. The gospel cannot fail. Jesus is better. Jamie and Amanda and Shepard from Turkey. relevant? When will we be home? When will we be safe and secure? Where do we put our hope? When will we have a safe, secure, and peace-filled home? As we continue our journey in Genesis The people of God and the promises to Abraham hang in the balance. Much like these fearful, displaced Iraqi Christians and others on the run, this little band, this little family is wondering what's our future hold? Will will we make it? Will God be faithful? When will we take the land? You see, as we've watched and we've walked through this, we've seen God be faithful to Abraham, and we've seen God be faithful to Sarah, and we've seen God provide a miraculously a son, the promised son. And we've seen God bless Abraham as he said he would. So, promised son? Check. Blessing? Check. But one of the things God said to Abraham is, to your offspring I will give this land. Do they have possession of the land yet? Nope. Abraham's a stranger, an alien, a wanderer, a sojourner. They've lived in tents and all their years they've been journeying around Canaan. They don't have possession of it. They don't yet have the land. You can hear conversations that Abraham would have with Sarah. Well, Sarah... Think we'll see another miracle in this amazing 62-year adventurous journey of faith that we've been on since we left our homeland of Ur? Remember how he gave us Isaac? I mean, we were boneheaded. We laughed, and Isaac means he laughs, and now we have Isaac. Not only that, remember when God provided the ram and gave him back to us as though from the dead? How's he going to give us the land? What's going to happen next, Sarah? 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 Genesis 23 opens. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, people living in the land, that possessed the land at the time, I am a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. Sarah dies. The matriarch, the princess of Israel, is dead. They don't have the land. They're not home. Abraham's soulmate of over 100 years, 62 since they left out on this journey of faith following this God who called them. Abraham weeps and grieves. You see, now the table is set all the more. Not only do we need a home, 
But now the future hope of Israel needs another woman. Isaac needs a wife so that the seed of the woman can continue. Remember this story we're on? It goes all the way back to the garden. When God's people had a land, they had a place, and then that serpent came in there and deceived the woman, and they bought the lie, and the fall ensued, and death entered, and the curses came, and they were sent out east of the garden. But God gave them a promise in Genesis 3.15. It says, through the seed of the woman, I'm going to crush the head of the serpent. Who's going to take Sarah's place to bring the seed of the woman through so that one day the head of the serpent could be crushed, so that all the families of the earth could be blessed like God said? The wandering Israelites were asking those questions. The band of disciples asked those questions, and you and I asked those questions. When will we have a safe, secure, peace-filled home? And in this context, the words of Jesus years later come piercing in when He said to His disciples, I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. The way home is through me. Jesus said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. See, the people of Israel, they were promised a land that they don't yet have, and a woman to bear offspring. Sarah had to die before Abraham and Sarah truly took possession of a piece of the promised land. What we see unfold in the rest of chapter 23, let's pick it up, I'll read through it quickly. The emphasis and focus of chapter 23 is really the land. Where am I going to bury Sarah? And her death affords the opportunity and is the time, is the gateway, as it were, into Abraham purchasing and possessing a small piece of the promised land in the heart of the land in Hebron. He buys a cave and a field where all of the patriarchs end up being buried. So he said to them in verse 4, I'm a sojourner and foreigner among you. Give me property among you for a burying place that I may bury my dead out of my sight. The Hittites answered Abraham, Hear us, my Lord, you are a prince of God among us. Bury your dead in the choices of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you his tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites, the people of the land. Verse 8. And he said to them, if you are willing that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat me for Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying place. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites. And Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites, of all who went in at the gate of his city. What's happening here, this is an official Real estate negotiation going down at the, at the gate of the city. All the people there witnessing it. And they're saying, they're, 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 they respect Abraham. Like, dude, you're a prince. We've heard the stories. Like, he's wealthy. He's got servants. He's got camels. He's got, you know, riches. God has blessed him and prospered him. So they're familiar with him. But he doesn't have rights. He's not a property owner. He actually doesn't have stake in the promised land. He's a sojourner. He's a foreigner. He's like, hey, I want a, po- I want a place of land so I can bury my wife. In fact, and he has it in mind, he says, this cave, this is the guy that owns it, there's this cave in this field, and that guy's there at the gate. And they're saying, hey, we'll, we'll, hey they're, they're, they want to treat him with kindness, you're here, we'll give you something. And Abraham says, no, I want, to, I want to buy some land. I want this official, I want this legal, I, I, want, a, I want a place, I want a foothold, I want to, I'm going to buy it. And now Ephron begins to interact with him <clears throat> at the gate. He says, no, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. We think, whoa, sweet. They're being kind to him and well, they're giving it to him. Does Abraham accept it? 
No. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land, and he said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, But if you will, hear me, I give the price of the field. Accept it from me that I may bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, My Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver? What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Now, commentators are mixed here. Like, are the people trying to be kind to Abraham and, like, give him the land? Or do they still want to kind of keep Abraham underneath them? They want to keep him kind of in their debt, right? They kind of want to keep, and Abraham's saying, I'm not trusting in the Hittites, in the people of the land of Canaan, to provide me with a place. God has promised. God will provide. I'm going to trust the Lord to give it to me. I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to buy it. I'm going to have, I'm going to have my place. Now, the price that Ephron quotes there, commentators say, that's an exorbitant fee. 400 shekels of silver, it's like they're extorting Abraham. Like, you, like, you can't afford it. Like, you can't, you can't afford this. You're not going to buy this. I mean, it's crazy. If I were to sell you the field and the cave, it's going to be such a high price. We know elsewhere in Scripture, like, Jeremiah buys a field for 30 shekels of silver. This is 400. Right? They're thinking, well, we want to keep Abraham. We don't know if we really want to give him that. But he's at the city gate. This is all official. What's Abraham do? As soon as Ephron mentions that, he says, sold. Boom, right there it says, Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites. 400 shekels of silver, according to the weights current among the merchants. So the field of Ephron and Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that was in it, and all the trees that were in the field throughout its whole area, was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of his city. Abraham, legal, official. It's a crazy story. Remember when that dude Abraham paid 400 shekels for that cave and field? Public, open, story wouldn't have been forgotten, no mistaking, no, well, no, he didn't really buy it, that didn't really happen, no question, publicly, that field, that land, that cave, that tomb belonged to the man Abraham. God's people have a seed, a deposit, a stake, a foothold in the promised land. Abraham bought the field by faith, knowing God would one day fulfill his promise and give him the whole thing. After this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre, that is Hebron, in the the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property for a burying place by the Hittites. Hebron becomes this amazingly important place in the history of the people of Israel throughout their story and throughout their journey. All of the patriarchs are buried there in this cave. Sarah first, then Abraham, later Isaac and Rebekah, Jacob and Leah. They're all buried there. Sarah died having not yet received the promise of the land, but in and through her death, she was the first to actually take possession and find a resting place in the promised land. Abraham purchased land in faith, believing God would give it to his family. In her death, the princess of Israel was the first to enter, the first to be laid to rest in the promised land. Now, here's something interesting. Just as God gave Abraham a grave in which to bury Sarah in the hope of receiving the promised land in full later, so too God has given us a grave and a tomb. See, this would have encouraged the people of Israel this way. They would have heard this story and go, that is supposed to be ours. God did say he'd give it to us. One day we will go in. We will have a home. God will make good on his promise. They were exiled. They weren't in the land. They would read this story and go, we have right to be there. God provided it for Abraham. Those who've gone before us have died, and they're there already waiting for us. would have encouraged them. God gave the people of Israel a grave in the heart of the promised land to encourage them that one day he'd give them a full and final secure resting place. 
God has given us a tomb that we look to, but it's not filled, it's empty. God has given us the empty tomb of Jesus that we look to and we see that's a guarantee that one day we'll have a promised land. He is the first fruits of a new creation raised from the dead and one day he'll purchase and renew the whole earth and we'll have a home with him and righteousness will dwell. All wrongs will be made right. We'll be at home with King Jesus. That's what the empty tomb says for us today. The tomb in Hebron There is another tomb in the heart just outside of Jerusalem, but it's empty. But we look to that tomb and we draw hope when we feel scattered, persecuted, wandering, sojourning through this world. One day we will have a home and we'll enter it, whether by death or by his return. You see, Abraham got a piece, just a deposit, just a seed. Later, we see Joshua, conquest, gets the whole promised land that God had showed Abraham. Later in the story of Israel, we see that Solomon expanded it as the kingdom expanded beyond the borders of the promised land. But the people fell away again, and we see that they lost the land, and they were exiled. They were kicked out again. And then Jesus Christ shows up, born in a little town in the heart of the promised land. And he comes on the scene and he begins to teach, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Jesus takes it to a whole nother level. He says, I'm going to give you the whole thing, brand new, for the glory of God. A new heavens and a new earth, a new city where righteousness dwells, safe from all enemies, safe on all sides. I promise. In Acts, the birth of the church, when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Before Jesus ascended back to heaven after his resurrection, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the what? Ends of the earth. Peter encouraged his persecuted listeners in 2 Peter chapter 3.13 saying, but according to his promise, that is Jesus, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells or in which rightness is at home. Does that encourage you? Was that a funeral? On Friday, Nadine Carey, Josh's grandmother, Candy's mom. Can we trust in the promise of Jesus that there is a peace-filled homeland after death? Absolutely. Does Jesus, is Jesus going to give us? Is he, gonna, is he preparing a place for us? Do you believe even when circumstances are stacked against you, even when it seems as though the promise hasn't come to pass before you. Sarah and others died not having received the promise. The promise is sure. Now we come to chapter 24. Look at the opening of chapter 24. It says, Now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. That's the place you underline that. That's so good. Abraham, the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. We come to this place now where 
Now we need, a, we need a woman. We need a bride for the promised son to continue the seed of the woman. And this chapter is long. We'll read some of it. won't read all of it. But it's really four parts. You see, Abraham, as we'll see here, grabs his servant and says, I want you to go and find a wife for my son Isaac. We've got to have a woman who will carry this thing forward. And Isaac's not yet married. He says, go. So he gives him clear instructions. We'll see in a moment. He sends him. Then the servant faithfully says, yep, signs up for the mission, takes the long journey and goes. And he comes to the town near Abraham's descendants in the north where Abraham had come from all those years ago to his kindred. And he sits and he waits and he prays. He says, okay, Lord, show me who's it going to be. I don't know who's it going to be. And he's at, a, he's at a well. And we see he encounters this woman named Rebecca. And through an awesome story, Rebecca's the one. But then we go, well, is, this, is her family going to let us go? Are you going to let her go? Come back with us? And then we see the third movement of this chapter. So it's Abraham and his servant, the servant and Rebecca. And we see the servant and Rebecca's family, her brother Laban and her dad. They agree. And then Rebecca comes with them, and then we see Isaac and Rebecca meet each other at the end, and they get married. They love each other. It's an awesome story. You ever notice how children love to hear the story? And maybe you, think about this. Don't you love to hear the story of how your parents or your grandparents met and how they fell in love and all the circumstances around when they met and how they met? It's a really cool story. And like, if they hadn't have met, like, I'll tell you this. On July, this is an interesting date. You don't care anything about this date, but I care very much about this date. July 19th, 1964. July 19th, 1964, in the southeast corner of Washington State, near the Tri-Cities, on a hot summer night in the Tri-Cities desert sun, a young man and a young woman both made the decision to go to the drive-in theater to go see West Side Story. And they met there that night on July 19, 1964. The young woman's name was Marilyn Ratchford, and the young man's name was Larry James. My mom and my dad met at the drive-in theater in the Tri-Cities, 50 years ago, this summer, when they were in high school, watching West Side Story at a drive-in theater. Chance. This happened to me, happened to fall in love, happened to have three boys, I happened to be the youngest. My life is the result of just a string of coincidences and happenstances, isn't yours? Believe in coincidences? You say, that day doesn't mean anything to you guys, but does it mean something to me? God brought me into the world through that chance meeting. What's the story of your parents or your grandparents? I heard the story of Earl and Nadine on Friday. When Earl met Nadine, this is Pastor Josh's grandparents, this is Carrie's mom and dad. When Earl met Nadine, she was engaged to another boy. He pursued her anyway. Didn't take no for an answer. Things apparently fell through with the other dude, and Earl won the prize. <laughs> Marries Nadine, and they just happened to have three daughters, the oldest of which was Candace. Candy. Who just happened to meet and marry a man named Greg. Who just happened to have two boys named Josh and Carrie. Was God involved in Earl meeting Nadine? Stop, stop and thinking about it. Has God blessed your life through Earl and Nadine Carey having candy? Who then, Greg and Candy, having Josh and Carey? Anybody here been blessed by God? So was God somehow intricately, intricately? intimately involved in the non-miraculous happenstance meetings of two people falling in love? Can we trust God to oversee our very existence as people to coincidental meetings? 
You see, the people of Israel hang in the balance as they hear this story. They would have been around the campfire on the edge of their seat going, man, as the, as the author writes this story and tells us this story, the narrator actually gives us information that the characters inside the story don't yet have. He's a good storyteller. So we're on the outside going, oh man, we know it's Rebecca. It's going to be Rebecca. But the servant doesn't know it yet. Watch this. We'll go quick. This will be fun. Chapter 2. Or chapter 24, verse 2. Chapter 24, verse 2. And Abraham said to his servant, the oldest of his household, who had charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh that I may make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell, but will go to my country and to my kindred and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, Perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Very reasonable question. Like, hey, what, I mean, what if she doesn't believe some old guy from 500 miles south to come with me to marry some dude she's never met? Like, what if that doesn't happen, Abraham? Yeah. And here we see Abraham's faith really refined in his later years here. He's very confident that the Lord will fulfill his promise. Abraham said to him, See to it that you do not take my son back there. So, so the servant's going, like, so if that doesn't work out, do you want me to get Isaac and bring him up here to find a wife? Abraham's saying, no, 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 no. No going back. No turning back. We're here. We got land now. We're the people of God. God this is where we belong. This is where God's called us to be. We're going to multiply. God's going to fulfill his promise. We're supposed to be here. Whatever you do, don't take Isaac and go back there. We're, the, we're here. This is the land God's brought us. So he says, you go do it. But he repeats this multiple times, like, no turning back. I love that. Even when things are hard and on the brink and you're facing that, it's like, no, God's called us. Stay the course. Endure. Trust. Believe. Don't go back. Where are we at? Verse 7. The Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and who spoke to me and swore to me, to your offspring I will give this land. Look at what Abraham says here. He will send his angel before you, and you shall take a wife from my son from there. Here, Abraham's very confident. I don't know how, but the Lord's going to work it out when you get there. The Lord's going to oversee this and work it out. But if the woman, and then look what he says to the servant. He says, verse 8, but if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you'll be free from this oath of mine, only you must not take my son back there. So the third servant put his hand on the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. This is really like, this is a personal oath and promise between these guys that have been together a long time. Abraham's most trusted, faithful servant. He's going to go on a 500-mile journey north. It's going to take him three weeks, going to help find a wife for Isaac. It's a big deal to Abraham. The servant takes it seriously, and he goes. He's off. Look at verse 10. It says, The servant took ten of his master's camels and departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. He rose, and he went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. And he said, now the servant's here going, okay, I'm here. Oh, my goodness. How am I, who? Who's this lady going to be? Oh, Lord, God of my master Abraham, please grant me success today and show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Behold, I'm standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Let the young woman to whom I shall say, please let down your jar that I may drink, and who shall say, drink, and I will water your camels. Let her be the one whom you have appointed for your servant Isaac. By this I shall know that you have shown steadfast love to my master. Now, he's not asking actually for anything miraculous. This isn't supernatural, like sun stand still, part the waters, beaming light from heaven. This is the one. That's not the deal. This is like, he's like, I'm on the lookout. I'm going to ask a girl to give me a drink. And if she gives me a drink and like will water all my camels, then I'm hoping, Lord, she's the one. That's the kind of girl I'm looking for. Gracious, hardworking. Look at verse 15. Before he had finished speaking, behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, came out with her water jar on her shoulder. 
The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom had, no man had known. She went down to the spring, filled her jar, came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, please give me a little water to drink from your jar. She said, drink, my lord. And she quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will draw waters for your camels also until they have finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough and ran again to the well to draw water. And she drew water for all his camels. The man gazed at her in silence to learn whether the Lord had prospered his journey or not. See, he doesn't yet know, but we know. It's Rebecca. It's Abraham's kindred. We got a winner. Okay? It would have taken Rebecca over two hours to make 80 to 100 trips down steps into a well to draw water to water all of this servant's camels who would have each drank 25 gallons of water. Gives him a drink, says, I'll water your camels. Sweat running down her face for two hours. He's observing her, watching her serve this stranger, someone she doesn't even know, working hard, waters his camels. When the camels had finished drinking, verse 22, the man took a gold ring weighing half a shekel, two bracelets for her arms weighing ten gold shekels, and said, please tell me whose daughter you are. Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, we have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. The man finds out it's one of Abraham's kindred. How does the servant respond? The man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord and said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of my master Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and his faithfulness toward my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsmen. Ha! God! Now, this is the point where all the children sitting around the fires are telling this story. And when Rebecca responded the way that the servant prayed, that if she responds this way, that it, all the children are giggling, laughing, and going, it's Rebecca. They know this is, it's going to be Isaac and Rebecca. God is sovereign. Don't you love it when it says, before he had finished speaking. There is a question. Have, do you, can you recall a time maybe early in your faith journey with God and with Christ, that God encouraged your faith by some specific answer to prayer. Isn't that cool when that happens? Like, God, He knew! Wait a minute! For Rebecca to have been there already, well, I was praying, and I'm I'm not even done speaking. She said, hey... God knew and had already begun to, Rebecca left her house to come out to the well before I even, God, but I, he answered my prayer. I'll tell you a quick story, I got to be quick here, because in, in my own journey, many of you know my story and how God rescued me and saved me, called me out of life of sin and rebellion and wandering, and early in my journey of coming to Christ and really seeing that God is real and He hears and He knows and He he answers prayer and He loves me even in my sin and He sent Jesus to die for me to forgive me and He'd welcome me home. It's too good to be true and He forgave me my sin and I was up one night and I was was praying because I I was trying to make decisions to get disentangled from my life of sin. And so I had intentionally procrastinated from doing a paper that was due at school. This is in college. Because I wanted the excuse of, hey, I, I can't come out tonight because i got a paper to work on. And so the party going on Saturday night, oh, come on, man, you know, we'll hook you up and blah, blah, blah. It's like, man, i got a paper to write. So I write the paper. I stay up late, like all night Saturday night, like 2 in the morning. I get done writing the paper. And I'm just, and I'm doing this because, like, Lord, help me. How do I get out of this situation? I'm living in a bad situation. And God's working on my life. And God, just show me yourself and show me what to do. I don't know what to do next. And got out of that one, and, but each day, each day is like, this is so fresh and real, you know, and I lay there, and I'm praying, and, and I got to thinking about my parents, who had taught me, and they took me to church, and they had taught me about Jesus early in my life, and I said, Lord, and the idea came to me, it's now Sunday morning, and I thought, and I don't know where the thought came from, but I was, Lord, I said, it came like this, it was like, I want you to get up, 
get a backpack, get some stuff together. I want you to drive north to Pateras and surprise your parents and go to church with them. I'm like, Lord, it's like two and three now, three in the morning because I'm right, mine's racing, I'm not, can't fall asleep. And um, I said, Lord, I'll be way too early for church. He says, I want you to go to your favorite restaurant. I want you to go to the Superstop, which is still, which was there when I was there, by the way. It's still there today, the Terrace. I want you to have your favorite breakfast, biscuits and gravy. You guys, you laugh, but I'm like, this is going through my mind. I'm like, I'm going to make a nice drive, window down. I'm going to watch the sunrise. I'm going to have my favorite breakfast, biscuits and gravy. I'm going to be fresh. I'm going to come out, meet my parents. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to surprise them. And Lord, I just want to bless them, thank them. Wow, it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow their mind. So I did. Got up. I got my little backpack ready. I was reading. My heart's pounding. I'm like, am I really going to do this? This is crazy. This is nuts. Get in my little 83 Ford Escort. Drive up the highway, window down. It was an amazing drive. The sun is rising. Oh, it's crazy. I'd always been, you know, sleeping in late, hungover. I never was up this early, you know, in my right, man, my right mind watching the beauty of God's creation. Now I'm a new man. I'm a new creation. I'm going, this is nuts. This is crazy. It's so peaceful. Uh, you know, I, it's just the Lord ministered to me the whole drive, hour drive, poof, to the terrace, pulling the super stop. It's open, breakfast, biscuits and gravy. All the while I'm thinking, God, you really do love me. It sounds crazy, but like biscuits and gravies, God's love to me. So I come out of the parking lot. I'm done. I'm taking my time. I look up, and my parents are already getting their car to leave it to go to church. It's still way ahead of the time. I mean, I was going to go get dressed at the house and be ready. And I'm like, whoa, 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 what are they doing? I run out in the street, and I wave my arms to get their attention because they're starting to leave. And I'm in the intersection at Pateras there by the superstop in my parents' house. And thankfully, I got their attention. They see me. They'd come across the way, they come into the, the parking lot there at the Superstop, and they roll down the window, and I'm like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> it's way too early for church. You're not supposed to leave for like another, you know, half hour. They look at me, they're like, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing here? So, and I noticed they're really dressed up really, really dressed up. Like, my mom was in a dress, and my dad, like, a suit coat to go to church in Matt Howe. Like, that doesn't happen. I'm like, that's strange. And uh, I said, well, craziest thing. I was, I finished a paper late at night. I couldn't go to sleep, and I was thinking about you guys. I was praying for you, and thinking about the Lord's been doing in my life, and I just thought, I wanted to surprise you guys and drive up here early and go to church with you in the morning. I thought I would encourage you. I wanted to say, I love you, and thanks for telling me about Jesus and sticking with me through all the stuff I did. My mom gets a tear in her eye running down her face. And she says, well, that's really interesting, Adam. We hadn't told you or the boys this, but this morning, your father and I are renewing our wedding vows in church. I said, well, the Lord must have knew. Now I know why I'm here. I went to church that day, and I saw my parents kiss, which was a big deal. It didn't happen in our home. We didn't see much kissy-kissy in the public thing, not around my house. I saw them kiss. I was 19 years old. I'm in college. I was like, whoa, this is really weird. <laughs> Jesus is changing my life. I'm driving out of town with an idea, and I'm watching my parents kiss. Like, what in the world is going on? The whole world's getting saved. Jesus is coming back. It's real. You, know, you wonder why sometimes my hair's on fire. I'm like, God's real. All right? Now, that's a long story. You, I tell you, do you think God used that answer to prayer to encourage my feeble faith? Do you think God used that event and that answer to prayer to encourage my parents' faith? Does that encourage your faith? Does God still do that kind of stuff today? He did it for the servant, Genesis 24. Is God working in natural ways through coincidental meetings and happenstances? And yeah, He is, friends. And it would have really encouraged the Israelites and given them hope every time they read this story and heard this story. Tell us again how Isaac and Rebekah, tell us again about... Abraham and the servant. Tell us again about Rebecca. The story goes on, and, and the family even 
agrees, and Laban, who's kind of a shady character, you'll hear about him later, he's kind of greedy. He sees the, the gold and the stuff that the servant gave. Oh, well, come on in! Uh, have food! We'll be hospitable to you, get to know you, you know? And, and, and the servant's like, look, I'm here on mission. Before I eat a thing, I just need to let you know, I need to know if, here's the deal. And he tells him the whole story, he recounts the whole thing, what Abraham said to him, and then what he experienced at the well. Jump ahead and all the way to verse uh, 49 of 24. The servant says, Now then, if you are going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or the left. There's more tension now because, like, the dad and the brother, are they going to give the okay for Rebecca to go back with this dude to marry Isaac? Well, it turns out, after he tells them the whole story and the way the whole thing went down, even Laban and, and, and the dad, Bethuel, verse 50, they answer and say, The thing has come from the Lord. Yet we cannot speak to you bad or good. Behold, Rebecca is before you. Take her and go. Let her be the wife of your master's son, as the Lord has spoken. And when Abraham, the servant, heard these words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. And he brings out more gifts to the family to bless them with. He's preparing to leave. And they say, hey, we want her to stay another 10 days. He's like, don't delay me. I've got to get back. I'm on this mission. So they said, well, you're going to have to ask Rebecca if she's ready to go right away. So they go to Rebecca. Look at verse 57, 58. They called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? And here Rebecca, in a stunning, simple faith in the God of Abraham, because she had heard the whole story, heard the servant's tale, heard all about this, her distant relatives in this land, and Abraham, how God had blessed them and prospered them. She hears all this, and she answers with a simple, humble, I will go. God in this far-off land has found a young, beautiful, graceful, hardworking, submissive, willing servant girl who will say yes to, to be the woman to carry the seed of the offspring forward. And she's just, they send her away and they bless her as she goes. Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands. May your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. Same blessing that Isaac had received, now Rebecca receives. You see, God's securing the future of his people from generation to generation, God's being faithful here. And Rebecca and her young women rose and rode on the camels and followed the man. The servant took Rebecca and went on his way. And now we come to the meeting of Isaac and Rebecca, verse 62. Isaac had returned from Beer Lahai Roy, was dwelling in the Geb, and Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening, and he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, there were camels coming. And Rebecca lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. Now notice, this is the part where we, again, we have information they don't have. We know Rebecca saw Isaac. Rebecca doesn't know who she sees here. That's why she asks, who is the man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, it is my master. So she took her veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all the things that had happened, all the story of what had been done. And Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah, his mother, and took Rebekah. She became his wife, and he loved her. That's a great line. And he loved her. The promised son loves his bride. The one that God had chosen and brought to him. The promised son loves his bride. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death when the seed of the woman continues I know i got to wrap this up. Listen. Do we see the amazing hand of God at work in bringing Israel into existence, in protecting and securing the line of the family that would ultimately bring our Savior Jesus. You see that God is not only involved in supernatural but natural ways, even in our lives, in intimate and intricate ways. Things that you could write off as coincidence and circumstance, but you could see the hand of God. Not only would the angel of the Lord, as Abraham was confident, go before Abraham's servant and select a young woman to carry forward the mission of the seed of the woman to bring Israel into existence. 
But in the fullness of time, years later, an angel named Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee to a beautiful, young, grace-filled, hard-working woman named Mary who said, here I am. May it be to me. I'm your servant. And she would bring Jesus into the world, the seed of the woman who would crush the head of the serpent to bring salvation and the church into existence. So what are the instructions, encouragement, and hope for us? Three very simple things as we encounter these chapters and this story moves from generation to generation. Number one, God is sovereign. God is sovereign. The invisible hand of God is working in amazing ways in supernatural and natural ways, guiding history for His purposes and our salvation, carrying the seed through a woman. As God's people today, the details of our lives in both supernatural and altogether natural ways are, are guided by God's sovereign care. Do you believe that? Do you have hope that God is sovereign even in the face of circumstances that might say, this is on the brink, this could go south, this is all getting shut down right now. I don't see a way through this. Number two, God is faithful. The people of Israel would have heard this story and said, man, we really do have a home in the future. We really do have a home coming. God is watching over us, taking care of us, guiding us. We do have a future. We are his special chosen people. Look at this story. Look at how God orchestrated the events to bring us into existence. Is he going to bail on us now? No way. God is faithful. And thirdly, God really does love us. He really, really does love us. His steadfast love from generation to generation the Israelites would have read this and gone, man, what a ride. Oh my goodness, we're on the brink again and again. And this is amazing. He's amazing. He really does love us. The promised son, Jesus, really does love his bride, the church. Jesus really does love us. He really is faithful. He really is sovereign, even over those circumstantial meetings and events and happenings. And when we pray, God's at work already. God is faithful from generation to generation and will be until we are finally in our true homeland. Rest on all sides. One day, friends, the whole earth will be our home where justice reigns and righteousness dwells when moth and rust and fire and ISIS do not destroy. And those who have this assurance and hope give their lives Lay down their lives to bring this hope to a broken and hurting world. Those who have this hope purify themselves in order to seek to alleviate suffering, to welcome strangers, to protect the innocent, to seek justice, to rebuild the broken, to restore the streets torn down. And in so doing, we give a glimpse of this hope in tangible form and we set the stage to talk about Jesus who is the source of true hope and peace no matter what you face. And so we sign up to go and serve people in Pateras, to be tangible expressions of hope to people who've lost much, to say, will we ever have a home? Why are you here helping restore and repair what's broken? It's a foretaste of what I believe and I know is coming later. I want to seek to make this world safe and secure, knowing it won't be perfected now, but I do so now because I know one day it will be later. I want a peace. I want a deposit. I want a seed. And it's coming in full. Jesus keeps his promise. 
whether after our death or at his return.